this morning we wait at your feet humbled by your love and your mercy and your kindness towards us just as in the words your child sang just now we were just outcasts but you crossed the line and reached and touched each one of our lives but not only that lord you crossed the line back and took us along with you that in the heavenly realms today we are no longer alone as outcasts we are known as sons and daughters of the living god we thank you we thank you speak to us this morning speak to us may your word touch our hearts and give strength to our soul renew our spirit this morning oh god is another year lies ahead we do not know what lies ahead but all we ask that you be with us every day of the year that lies ahead we know you will leave not leave us nor forsake us so help us oh god not to leave you but to stay close to us speak to us lord this morning for in jesus name we pray amen 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 i want to start this morning again going back to the same danish theologian we looked at last sunday his illustration another illustration of his which has come to us in so many different forms stories once upon a time there was a prince i can see the smile on all the young ladies face they love princes and everyone is waiting for their prince to come he will he will he will come up now number aayega don't worry <laughs> this prince wanted to find a girl suitable for himself so one day when he was in a remote area of his father's kingdom he saw a simple peasant girl village girl out of the window of his carriage and he looked at her and he fell in love with her but the question was even a prince even a prince wants a girl to love him for who he is the man behind the crown so what could he do he could command the girl to marry him and she would many kings have done it or most kings have done it or he could go dressed in all his splendor in his carriage with a retinue of his men to her little hut and say i want your hand she probably would take his hand but you don't know whether it is because of his splendor or because it of him the man so he came to a solution he had a deal with his father and he went to that little village as a peasant and he looked among them for some time he became one of them and one day the peasant girl fell in love with him and she had no idea he had always loved her she so asked her would you marry me and she said yes i will so he told her this is who i am This is the story of the cross. One day the king son fell in love with this peasant girl. Now he could command us love me because he is God he can bend our will. Or he could come in all his glory like all the gods of this world come you know all the gods you see the pictures they come in all their glory he didn't. He said well you would never know whether you really love me for my glory. or because who i am 
So 2000 years ago he came as a poor carpenter's son. And he lived among us, walked among us, showed us what he is like. And a lot of people fell in love with him. The set of people who fell in love with him is called the church, the bride of Christ. Because of who he is. Not because of his power, not because of his splendor, but because of who he is. So, the question is not to the prince. The question is to the princess. The peasant who has become a princess. The question is to her. When we take stock taking at the end of the year, we ask ourselves, what does my prince think of me after four years? I want us to turn to Revelation chapter 2 and verses 1 to 7. When this prince talks to the bride first, personally, stock taking, in the book of Revelation, is the first time we see this prince doing a stock taking about his bride. He talks about his bride. This is what he says. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things say he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience, and have labored for my namesake, and have not become weary. He's saying all these things about us. All these things you have done. Truly you have done. I'm telling you, as a pastor, you have done this. You have stood the test. Nevertheless, I have this against you. Now, I'm not saying that. I'm saying each one needs to ask the Lord, do you say this about me? That you have left your first love. Remember therefore from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works. We'll stop there. We won't read the rest of it. Can we just stop there and do stock taking has to. The, quest, the title of today's message is First Love. He says in verse 4, Remember, nevertheless I have this against you. You have left your first love. He's not saying you have left your first lover. Okay, There's a difference between the two. Meaning you left your first boyfriend and now you are with me. That's not what he is saying. He says you have left your first love. Rome, but the intensity of your love for me in the beginning. He says, do you still have that after four years? It's been a tough four years for many of you, many of us. So the question is, the prince and the peasant girl. How do we know whether the peasant girl is still truly passionate about her relationship with her prince. How do we know? Has our devotion turned to duty? That's a question God is asking. When you began, you were devoted to me. And because of the devotion, you did the whole things. Now if I look at it, you are doing the same set of things, but it's no longer devotion, it is duty. Now to which church is he writing this? The church in Ephesus. Now, if you look at the Spirit of God writing through the Apostle Paul a letter to the same church some 35 years earlier called the letter of Ephesians, don't turn there. At least, if I'm right, 20 times Paul writes in the letter of Ephesians about the church of Ephesus' love for Christ. 
He talks about the love of this church for Christ at least 20 times in that letter. That's the Spirit of God. 35 years later, the same Spirit comes and writes through Apostle John and says, You have forgotten your first love. So listen carefully, receive prayerfully, and apply diligently. I want to take a strange, probably, scripture connected with going back to our first love. As a church and as individual members of the body of Christ. I want you to turn with me to Ephesians 5. And verses 21 to 32. This is the portion that is usually taken at every marriage seminar and every wedding. The pastor preaches usually from this portion. Submitting to one another in the fear of God. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as also Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious wife. What did I say? Wife. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So the husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is the great mystery. Paul says, this is a great mystery. I don't understand this. Meaning, I'm a single man, and this is about marriage, and I'm writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It's a great mystery. But let me tell you, brothers, he's saying, if you thought I was talking about husbands and wives, I wasn't. I was talking about Christ and the church. Though you can apply it in marriages, he says, the primary purpose of these lines is not about a husband and a wife or a marriage sermon or a marriage service. I'm talking to you about, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So these verses are what we are going to look at. Paul says, marriage is a mystery. And all married people will agree it's still a mystery. But within that mystery lies the relationship of Christ and His church. In that mystery lies the entire relationship of Christ and the church. The relationship with Christ is not a cold, dead relationship. It is a passion, deep passion that flows into every area of your life. Every woman and every man who is married knows from the day you got married, everything changed in your life. Every area of your life was touched by that simple ceremony. There is no area in your life is untouched by marriage. Everything touches. Because that's the way it is. And God says, in your relationship with me, every area of your life will be touched. And you will see the other person who has come into your life will affect every area of your life. And you bring that passion into every area of your life. We are not bricks. We are living stones. That's what scripture says. Being with great care 
and patience being built by a master builder so that we can become the bride of his son the great spiritual house as peter calls it and he's working on all of us all of us he's working on us and it's not finished so if you go back to verse 21 when god talks about his bride the church the first thing that he mentions about as a characteristic of his bride or his son's bride is a submitted church first thing he talks about is about building this mysterious relationship with his son he talks about submission strange right but that's true if you look back into your marriages when you began the first struggles and the continuous struggles is always about submission i'm not talking about the wife i'm talking about both husband and wife suddenly you realize you have to change your ways for the other person and that is submitting submission does not come naturally to us because the old natural mind is hostile to god romans 8 and verse 7 it is hostile submission naturally doesn't come to the man who is married tomorrow to change for this new woman who has come into his life but it is imperative because the carnal mind is in enmity against god for it is not subject to the law of god it will not subject to the law of god nor indeed can be the carnal man james who got saved and came into the church is not ready to listen and submit to christ so something supernatural has to take place the carnal man had to be born again to start submitting first that supernatural thing has to happen so you are born again and the first thing god says in ephesians 521 is what does it say within the church submit to one another we understand the concept okay i need to submit to god i need to submit to god i need to submit to god god says i know that and you know that because i am god and you are not but that's not what god says god says submit to one another submission means what does it mean simple terms yielding control sometimes we try the wrong way by making a set of rules i want my tea at 6 breakfast at 8 this is the way i like my clothes i am this is what i want more with dabba and we think if the wife does all that it is submission and some husbands like it but that's not what submission is and that's not how submission is brought in though that's one of the methods usually used there is another approach you are today's bakra okay rishi rishi is inflexible when it comes to time he likes doing his own thing 20 hours before the computer and 4 hours in bed but sometimes the other way 20 hours in bed and 4 hours before the computer but that's his way and he is his boss when it comes to time second when it comes to his appearance let's say he's careless he's not bothered he picks up the first thing that comes out of the closet if it comes out <laughs> when it comes to spending money he likes spending money but only on himself these are only illustrations don't go around and say this is what you are rishi okay now when it comes to real things he is in control of his time his appearance and his money then one day he meets nisha for those of you who do not know they're going to get married in 2 months time okay he meets nisha and he falls in love with nisha now 
he has to yield control over his time because of love. The same man whom you couldn't get to do anything, his time is at her disposal. You call me anytime, I'll pick the call. I will drive anywhere to come and see you. Time is no longer an issue. Now, was there any rules? No. What did he do? He submitted his time into her hands. She submitted her time into his hands. There is a yielding that is taking place because of love. Second, one day Nisha says, you know Rishi, my favorite color is blue. Next day you see, Rishi is wearing blue jeans, blue t-shirt. If he could, he would paint even his teeth blue. (laughs) Why did he do that? His father has been telling him for years, change the way you look. He said, this is the way I like it. Nisha just has to whisper. Are you getting it? When it comes to money, you can't get a rupee out of Rishi. (laughs) Nisha just has to whisper her needs and her wants. His wallet is at her disposal. What happened there? A naturally carnal minded person has fallen in love with somebody and everything has been submitted to her desires. God says that's what happens with the church when it falls in with Jesus. As an individual and as a body, when we fall in love with Jesus, my time is at your disposal. How do you want me to look like? You just have to tell My resources are your resources. You tell me how to spend it, I will spend it. Because love will bring submission. Submission means I am not independent. I am dependent. For 25 years or 26 years, Rishi lived. I am independent. I don't need anybody. Then one day he meets Nisha and says, I am not independent. I am dependent. I need you. I cannot live without you. That's what happens to a man. When he meets Christ, he says, I am dependent. I need you. I cannot live without you. That's what submission means. It is in... But what does Ephesians 5.21 say? Submitting to one another in the fear of God. Meaning that that's the right where holiness comes in. So we leave that aside because you've been hearing too much about holiness. But think about it in the terms of the mystery of the marriage of Christ and His church. Where Christ comes and says, I submit to you. Telling the church, I am not independent of you. Though I was as creator God, when I stepped into flesh and died for you and rose again, I am also submitted to you. I need you. I cannot live without you anymore. There was a time when I could live without you. That was before creation. But once I came down and went through the cross, I want you. I cannot live without you. I submit to your desires even as you submit to mine. It's, it's, it doesn't boggle the mind to believe the Creator God submits to His creation. He did at the cross. He did. So God says, because I submit to you, my time, that is called eternity, is for you. My resources is at your disposal. My appearance. Now because I am the original and you cannot get better than this, I want you to look like me. I can't look like you. But I want you to look like me. Are you seeing what submission does? The evidence that as an individual, 
or as a church we are submitted to God is seen in the fact when we are submitted to one another. That's the problem. That's the problem. Most problem, most people do not have much issues with submitting to God because they believe it's all in their private space. God says no. Your submission to me will be visible, what we call positional submission and functional submission. Positional with God. I am submitted to you, Lord, in all things. I cannot do anything without you. Functional, he says, when I see you submitting to one another, that's how it works out. The only thing that stands in this submission, that's a result of love, that can stand the major, major block is pride. Pride is the facet of the old man, carnal man. It's a reflection of the self. Pride will not submit. Pride hates submitting. Because pride started with Satan and he became a rebel. He didn't like submitting to God's authority. And he brought that into the garden and man swallowed it. That's why if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 26, we have looked at it so many times, but I want to look at it. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise, according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. We'll stop there. That's all. Why? Why are the wise not called? Why are the mighty not called? Why are the noble not called? You mean God doesn't love the mighty? If you are wise, God doesn't love you? If you are noble, God doesn't love you? No, that's not true about love. God is not a respecter of persons. The reason is, if you are wise, in your own eyes, if you are mighty, and if you are noble, what happens? Along with that comes a huge dose of pride. And the wise will not submit. The mighty will not easily submit. The noble will not easily submit. That's the problem. Solomon was wise. Beyond his means. His wisdom did not come naturally. His wisdom came when he was humble as a young man. And he submitted to God and God gave him wisdom. But when he became wise, did he submit? No, he became a rebel. There's nothing wrong with wisdom. But be careful. Wisdom shouldn't stop you from submitting to a weaker brother who has been put over you. Or a younger sister who's there in the church. Your wisdom shouldn't become a block. Samson was mighty. Was he? Did he submit? No, he didn't. Why didn't he submit? Because he was mighty. He took his might and decided everybody else needs to submit, but I don't have to submit because I am mighty. David was a shepherd, simple shepherd. Picked and made king. And because he was a shepherd and made a king, he always submitted because he never forgot where he came from. After David, the ones who came are sons of kings. They are not called shepherd kings. David is the only shepherd king there because his father was a shepherd and he was a shepherd. So when he went and sat in the king's throne, he knew this is grace. He knew half his time had been spent in the wilderness looking after sheep. And when he went back to sleep, he probably had to sleep in the out or sleep in one of the tiny little rooms in his father's house. He knew what he was. He knew he was a shepherd who was picked by God and made a king. But his sons grew up in the palace and they were sons of a king. So you will see almost all of them were proud. And therefore, there's hardly anybody in the history of Judah or Israel who were submissive as kings. Just a few. Here and there you will find one or two. Why? Because they were noble by their birth. Moses at 40 was a prince called by God. But he was noble, 
Mighty and wise. Terrible three combinations. Therefore, he did not submit. He didn't even wait for God to tell him what to do. He said, I don't need. I am mighty, I am wise, and I am noble. I'll use my sword and I will deliver Israel. God says, you need a theological degree called BD. You need to go to the backside of the desert. Forty years. Forty years. As what? As a shepherd. Later you need to, you need to understand he is an Egyptian prince brought up in the wisdom and the culture of the Egyptians and when Joseph's brothers speak to the Pharaoh, they say we would like to live in Goshen. Joseph tells, tell the Pharaoh we would like to live in Goshen and we are shepherds and shepherds are a abomination to thee. This Egyptian man, an Israelite with an Egyptian culture is told by God, go to the wilderness and become an abomination to your old nature. Humble you. That's why he picked his profession for him. Picked his profession for him. You are an Egyptian and shepherds are an abomination to Egyptians. I, will, I know how to teach you humility. So that when the time comes you to be my leader, you will be a submitted leader. Go to Midian. Work under some man. You will have nothing. Your father-in-law is a shepherd. You will be a shepherd. It's an abomination for you for 40 years of your culture. 40 years be a shepherd. When the time comes, you will be yielded and submissive. And you shall be my prince. And lead Israel out. Are you getting the picture? Pride is a major block. Pride is a nature part of the old nature we brought in. That is the excess baggage we brought into the kingdom. And God says, get rid of it. Because the proud will not submit. And love submits. So the proud cannot really love. That's the problem. And the problem with pride is, if you are proud, you are naturally by God not enabled to love. Because pride and love don't go together. If you are a proud man, you cannot love. Though you may think you are in love, you don't love. Because your love is false. It's selfish. It's not the real love of God. You may drive 200 kilometers to meet your girlfriend. And you think, oh, I love her so much. But if she is not there, you will be angry. Because you did not drive 200 kilometers to see her. You drove 200 kilometers to please your own self. That's why you are angry. Because your love is false. The love of this world is false. It is all about self. And we get fooled by thinking, Oh, he loves me so much. Tell him to do something which he doesn't like. Then you will know if his love is real. Love, real love humbles. False love is always feeding self. Are you getting the picture? False love, when he buys clothes for you and you're so fascinated, will buy your clothes with he likes. Real love will pick stuff which you like, even if he doesn't like it. Consistently. Not for a few weeks. Consistently. Don't get fooled by thinking all love is the same. God says it is not. It is not the same. Because the love of a man or a woman who is proud is false. Because a proud man or a proud woman cannot love. Because they are antibodies. So God says in James chapter 4, verse 6 and 7, But He gives more grace. Therefore He says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Whom does God resist? The proud. Why do most marriages break? Most marriages break because of pride. 
either both parties or one party refuses to surrender in love because I will not and you know what God resists the proud he says I hate the proud because it's against my basic nature because I am humble and lowly he hates the proud and in a marriage husband and wife church and Christ I need grace every day but God gives grace to the humble he doesn't give grace to the proud he resists the proud the big stumbling block is pride the wise are proud usually The proud are self-sufficient or at least pretend they are. Submission means to yield control. Submission will always put you in a place of obedience. They will hate submission because he is proud and is a rebel. That's why God says, submit to one another. A proud man who is a wise man or a mighty man or a noble man is unable to love. The danger about it is that if you are proud, you cannot love. And if you cannot love, your relationship with Christ and your relationship with one another ultimately will be false, shallow and will die. Biblical submission is not weakness. It is strength. It's saying, I am not independent of you. I need you. Pride says, I don't need anybody Everybody needs me. Humility says, I need you. I need you. Read the letters of the great apostles and see what they say about others. I need you. I covet your prayers. I cannot survive without you. If I am succeeding in the mission, it's because of you who are far away. If you are a wise man, a mighty man, a noble man, it becomes very difficult because pride comes in. Like I told you, there is nothing wrong in any of these three. But do not let pride come in. If I am a wise man and a proud man, Vijay has a problem. Without Vijay asking, I will give him my counsel. Or if Vijay comes to me, I will give him my wise counsel. And if Vijay doesn't take my counsel, I will be offended. It's his problem. But I am offended. Why? How can you ignore my counsel? Why? Because I am proud. Though my counsel was right. If I am a humble man who has received wisdom from God and knows my wisdom is from God, Vijay comes to me and I give him my counsel. And I see he has rejected my counsel. I am not angry or offended. I am broken and I run to my closet. I am on my knees saying, Lord, let him not go that way. That's a difference. That's a difference. That's why God says, submit. Submit to one another. Within the body of Christ, submit to one another. That's why God says, many wise, many noble, many mighty are not called. Because I want to use them within the body, but pride will be a stumbling block always. They are always offended, 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 angry, upset. People may take your counsel or not, but that shouldn't make you upset. People may do a whole lot of things. God says, if you are humble, what will you do? You will run. That's why God says, Moses was the humblest of all. And Stephen says, Moses also was the wisest of all. What did the wisdom of God in Moses and the humility of Christ in Moses do? Every time they opposed his counsel, what did he do? He went before God. He went before God.
And God is asking us, as a church, as an individual within the church, how are we? God says, if you want to return to that first love, we need to have a submitted heart. In Hebrews 13 and verse 7, scripture says, Hebrews 13 verse 7, Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Remember those who rule over you. Whoever it is, whatever stage, wherever you are placed, those who rule over you, secular or ecclesiastic, whatever it is, remember those who rule over you. Why is he saying? Submit. Listen. Listen. Submit to them. Why? Because my son did. Like I said yesterday. Remember, those who were there yesterday, many were there not yesterday. Jesus came in the flesh. Full of the Holy Spirit. Born of the Holy Spirit. With the wisdom of ages. At the age of 12 at the temple in Jerusalem, they had no answer to his questions or no questions to his answers. 52 Sabbaths a year, he went to synagogue and sat there and listened to the boring rabbi's interpretations about himself. Because he was the word. Did he say anything? Did he say, I can preach better than you, Rabbi? Did he sit there quietly? He sat there quietly. Why? Because he was humble and lowly and meek. And I believe he sat there and learned and listened and did not nod off. Then this is my impression. What the Pharisees will later say, we are not born of fornication. Implying, we know about your story, how you were born. They are calling him. We know, you are not legitimate. You are illegitimate. We know, your mother was not married when you were conceived. And scripture, the law says, actually, the bastard, the illegitimate, cannot enter into the sanctuary of the Lord. So I have a feeling, where he grew up in Nazareth, if he was considered illegitimate, the rabbi wouldn't call him to open the scroll and read. They gave him the scroll later when he was approved by the public. His brother Jude is one day called and says, read the scroll. He reads. His brother James is called and he reads. Every young man in his age group is called except Jesus. God said, sit down. And he sat down and kept quiet. Why? Because he was humble and submitting to one another. To the weakest and the lowliest of this brethren, Jesus submitted. Because God is love. And love submits. And in love there is no pride. In Jesus there was no pride. If we have to return to the first love as an individual or as a church, we have to return and be a submissive church, submissive to God, submitting to one another. James chapter 4 and verse 8. We looked at 6 and 7. 4 verse 8. Draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Let's stop there. Cleanse your heart. What do you cleanse your heart out of? Basically, pride. God says, I am humble and I am lowly. So God is looking for humble and lowly people. When you are humble and lowly, you can draw near to God. And when you are humble and lowly, God knows it, He will draw near to you. As I said, a church that submits to God is also seen functionally has a church that submits to one another, putting the need and the name of the other before you. First Peter chapter five verses five and six.
Likewise you younger people, since these days everybody considers themselves young because they make use of the various cosmetics available in the market. Younger people, all of you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with what? What? Humility, opposite of pride. Clothed with humility for God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you in due time. By the age of 30, God said, Time up, son. They didn't let you speak in the synagogue, my son? Yes, father. Don't worry, I'm giving you the world as the platform. Go out and speak. Go. They will come to you now to hear. The whole world will listen to you one day through the ages. And when you go back to Nazareth, they will take the scroll now and give it to you and say, You read now. Don't worry. Humble yourself. That's why I keep telling the church, don't ever think anybody is stealing your destiny. Because nobody can steal God's destiny for you. Cannot be. Cannot be taken. What God has purpose will come to pass. The only way you can happen is you can lose it by your rebellion. It cannot be stolen or taken by any pastor, any elder, any manager, any boss, any parent, any husband. It cannot be taken away. Cannot be taken away. Each or any wife, any child, don't, there are no excuses for losing your destiny other than rebellion. It will come to pass. That's how it works. Now come to Ephesians 5. Let's go back. We looked at verse 21. Submit. Keep that as a major text, okay? Submitting to one another in the fear of God. Wives, submit your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. All the ladies are heaving a sigh of relief. Thank God he's not talking about anything about women submitting to men, because that's not the message today. It's about the church submitting to Christ. Because Paul says, that's what I'm speaking about. Verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Now, if this is about Christ and the church, God is not talking to men. God is talking to the church. Church, you want to come back to the first love, start loving one another. A loving church, a submissive church. Second, a loving church. How does Christ love me? Look at the cross. Look at the cross. Did the peasant girl love the prince first? Or did the prince love the peasant girl first? Remember the story. Who loved whom first? Prince loved. First John. 1 John 4 verse 19. Four nineteen. We love him. We love the prince. Because he loved us first. It's as simple as that. We love because he first loved us. Okay, meaning the other implication of the story. Jesus loved me. That's why I love Jesus. But even to love Jesus, I have to look at his love for me to understand what love is. Because when I came to Jesus, I had many ideas about what love is. Then when I came to Jesus, I realized all those ideas were false and not very close to the truth. Then when I saw his love for me, I realized this is what real love is. And now he turns around and tells me, you love me and love the body the same way. That's the only kind of love that is real. There's no other kind of love that is real. John chapter 13 Jesus said to his disciples, The world will know that you are mine because of your incredible doctrinal purity. Did he say that? 
the world will know that you belong to me because of your righteous living. Did he say that? I know some Hindus and Muslims will give you a run for your money. The world will know that you belong to me the wonderful way you worship. There are more devotion sometimes in the temples than in the church. There's only one marker given by God. Only one marker. John chapter 13 verses 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you. That you love one another as I have loved you. That you also love one another. 35. By this all will know that you are my disciples. If you have love for one another. He says, there's one thing I'll tell you. Something the enemy cannot duplicate, that is love. He doesn't have the capacity to love. He can give you righteous living. He can give you wealth. He can have fake worship and devotion, everything. But one thing he's not able to do is to love the way I love. He cannot. That's how the world will know. You belong to me. You are my disciples. Why? Because... On earth, he says, when they see the way you love one another, that will separate you from the rest of the world. And that love attracts. That love attracts. That's why Jesus said, the entire law and the prophets hang on two little hinges. You can take a full door and write the whole Torah and Talmud and prophets and Psalms, everything in it. It has two hinges. What is? Love God, love your neighbor as yourself. It's all about love. Every sin is against love. Every sin is against love. And Jesus said in John chapter 12 and verse 32 And if I am lifted up from the earth what will I do? I will draw all peoples to me. What was lifted up above the earth? Rishi brought something for us yesterday this morning. What is lifted up? The cross. Jesus said, lift me up. That doesn't mean he said, if two disciples came and lifted him up, was he being lifted up? He said, there's only one place I can be lifted up above the earth which will draw men towards me. Where is that? Cross. He says, when a church allows the cross to be lifted up in their life and self dies and they love one another, it will draw all men towards them. Men will come like that. Just will come like that. If you are a loving person with the love of Christ in any workplace, they will come to you. Because that's something the world doesn't have. They will suspect you in the beginning by saying, do you have some ulterior motive in caring for me, praying for me, loving me, giving me? And once they see that you don't have, they will say, I was waiting for somebody like you. I've never seen anybody like you. Why? You have lifted Christ up above the earth. Because that's not a love that is natural. That's a love that is superficial. Supernatural. Because natural love will always get offended. God doesn't get offended. His love doesn't get offended. His holiness does. His love doesn't. Cain could not rejoice in the fact his younger brother's sacrifice was accepted simply because. Now real reason, simply because he didn't love his younger brother. We'll say jealousy, pride, hatred, murder. Because that's all results because of not loving. If you love your brother, then you won't be upset if your brother is accepted. You will only go to your brother and say, Brother, why were you accepted? Just show me also what it is. Because you love, and only a humble person can have real love. And because you are humble, you will learn from your younger brother too. Look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 9. We looked at that yesterday. 2, 9. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. 
He who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. You can have 101 issues and misunderstandings with your brothers and sisters. Please don't hate them. The minute you hate your brother or your sister, you have moved into darkness. You will start stumbling. You will start stumbling. It's you will start stumbling. He who loves his brother abides in the light. That doesn't mean you don't have issues with your brothers. You will have lots of issues with your brothers, your sisters, your spouse, whatever. But as long as there is not hatred, you will have light. Because God is love and God is light. And there is no cause for stumbling in him. Dangerous part. 1 John 3, 14. One John three and verse fourteen onwards three fourteen quick we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren remember yesterday's message also aware if you got baptized in water that doesn't mean you are saved many baptized people are in hell if you are baptized in the Holy Ghost doesn't mean You received gifts of power. Doesn't mean you are saved. Because many will come to me that day saying, Lord, Lord, we did all these powers, full works. And God says, I don't even know you. Just because you are a pastor and preach for 20 years, doesn't mean you are saved. There's only one way. In the Bible it says, you will know that you are saved. If you love your brethren, you have passed from death to life. Guard your heart from hating your brother. Guard your heart. Whatever the issue, whatever the cons- whatever has incited it, whatever, guard your heart from hating your brother. Because if you hate your brother and he who does not love his brother, what does he do? He abides in hate. What hurts me, pains me, is when I see the hatred within Christianity. I have disagreements with various doctrines. I don't agree with a lot of Catholic doctrine. But I love Catholics. Because I came from a Catholic family. But that's not the reason. I love Catholics. But you see the hatred within religion. Hatred. The venom that is poured out. And all of them claim to know God. God says, you do not know God. You are abiding in death. You are abiding in death. Our differences are doctrinal. Nobody is doctrinally perfect. There is only one whose name is Jesus. One day he will make us perfect. We are all imperfect. But God says, you know what? Love your brethren. Whether he is Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist, CSA. Doesn't matter what denomination tag he comes with. Love him. Anyone who hates his brethren abides in death. Dead people walking, sitting and living a lifetime within the four walls of churches. Very dangerous thing. And how do they think we are going to heaven? They look at all the things they have done. I got, I, I got baptized. I have gone to Sunday school. I have always been faithful to my church. I tithe regularly. I listen to every message. I take Bible studies also. I preach. God says, do you love your brethren? Two. Is there one brother you hate? One brother you hate. That's why scripture talks about in John chapter 3. Cain killed Abel because his works were evil. He did not become evil after killing Abel. He was evil before he killed Abel. Because he was a murderer in the heart because he hated his brother. Only thing that day when the fire of God fell upon Abel's sacrifice, the hatred became murder. But he was murdering him before that in his mind. How many people have you murdered? There's a difference between petty gossip and deliberate, meditated, venomous slander. Shows the depth of hatred in your heart. 
Guard your heart. Guard your heart. Because you're abiding in death. You're killing your brother. You're killing your brother. That is why he's talking about the Ephesus church. You know what? You do this, you do this, you do this, you do this, you do this. But you know there's one thing missing. You also murder a few people regularly. Lost your love. You're not a church that is abiding in love. God says, you know what? A church has to be a loving church. A submitted church, a loving church. And God is asking us, are we a loving church? Is our love sacrificial? If so, God says, I am lifted up above the earth and I am drawing men to me. Are you a giving person? Are you a giving church? When was the last time you did something sacrificially in secret? Let me tell you one thing. First, let me tell you one thing. In God's kingdom and God's church, there are no beggars. Beggars, arms are for the people outside who sit on the roads, not for God's children. So meaning, even the poorest widow has a might to give. There are no people within the kingdom of God who doesn't have the capacity not to give. Something. So there are no beggars. Beggars don't give, they only take. Are you a beggar? Or are you a giver? Because love gives. And Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. You have something to give. Something to give. Are you a giver? God's children don't need arms. God's children need charity. Charity is love. There are younger, weaker ones who need charity. What we are giving them is not arms. We are just sharing our love. We go out, we give them, we give them arms. And we show love. But here, this is not arms. All of it is love. There are no beggars in God's kingdom. Remember, there are no beggars in God's kingdom. In the year 1994, after the communism had collapsed in Russia, a new regime, and there was a government-run orphanage for abandoned, abused children. And two missionaries were invited to come and help out. So two missionaries from the U.S. went to this orphanage. And there was a little boy called Misha over there. They had to use a translator, teach them, show them. They had to teach abandoned, abused children. Children go through tremendous abuse, which we have no clue of, often. So one day, Christmas was near. They had just been there for a few months. Christmas was very close, so they told the Christmas story through the translator. Then they told them, do whatever you have understood according to that story. Give them color paper, some old uh, flannel clothes somebody had left. That's all they had. And the children all started cutting and making things. And at the end of the day, the missionaries came back and saw what they had. They all made, some made manger, crib, the Christmas, whatever, whatever, whatever. They came to Misha's. And they looked at Misha. He also had made the entire Christmas thing. And they look in, looked into the crib. There were two babies in it. Let me read it out carefully so that I don't make a mistake. This is so beautiful. They asked Misha, oh, why are there two babies in the crib? He said, when Mary put the baby into the crib, the baby looked at me and said, do you have a place to stay? So I told the baby, I don't have a daddy or a mummy. And Jesus told me, I can stay with him. But I said, all the others have gifts. I have no gift to give. So he looked at me with his eyes. And then I said, I don't have anything to give. But if I come and lie next to you and keep you warm with my body, will that be a gift? And Jesus said, yes. So I made the second baby and put it next to Jesus. And then Jesus said, you don't have to go away. You can live with me forever. Everybody there broke down. Because a little baby had found a savior. And he realized, if I don't have anything to give the savior, I can share my warmth with the baby. There are no beggars in God's kingdom. There are no beggars in God's kingdom. Even that 
young as tiny as little child when he encounters Jesus realizes he has something to give something to give because love always gives and God asks are we a loving church? 1 John 3 and verse 18 When I use the term church, I also use it corporately and also as an individual. My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Two verses I want to look connected with this. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 31. First Corinthians twelve thirty one. Verse thirty one. Somebody read it aloud if you can be faster than Vijay on the net. Honestly desire but honestly desire the best gifts. So is there anything wrong in this? Getting good gifts from God, spiritual gifts. Fourteen one. First Corinthians fourteen one. Desire spiritual gifts, but pursue. And on, especially that you may prophesy. First Corinthians 12 is all about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. First Corinthians 14 is all about the working of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. First Corinthians 13 ends, 12 ends with about desiring gifts. 14 begins with desiring gifts. But between these two chapters, an entire chapter about love. And he says, if you don't have love, even if you have all these gifts, you are worth nothing. Ezekiel sees a vision about a wheel within a wheel. The gifts are all these outer spokes of the outer wheel. Within it has to be love. God says, every spiritual gift has been given for a purpose, to love your neighbor. And people have taken gifts and built a kingdom for themselves. And God says, I do not know you on that day. Why do you think somebody can come to Jesus on that day and say, Lord, I drove up demons on that day. I healed the sick on that day. He says, because in your actions there was no love. You were doing it for yourself, for a name, for a glory, to make money. Because there was no love in it. In the kingdom, within the church, as individual members, God gives us. But be careful. The gifts have to be worked out in love. In love, in love. Pursue love. Desire gifts. Don't pursue gifts and desire love. God says, no, no, no. Pursue love. Pursue love. Pursue love. Pursue love. Pursue love. Desire spiritual gifts. What you should pursue? Can you see the beautiful way God balances 12, 14 within that an entire chapter about what love is? Because that is how it is. A church that operates in power should be very careful. It is a church that walks in love. Otherwise you will become a proud, obnoxious church. Obnoxious church. Mighty in miracles, mighty in powers, but nose up in the air saying, we are better than anybody else. No, we are not. We were saved by the same blood and the same sacrifice on the cross like anybody else. We are no better than anybody. If ever God says you're better than somebody else, it's because He says you're more loving than the others. That could be the only reason and no other reason. God says, don't forget the purpose. Look at the exhaustive list of gifts in Corinthians 12 and Romans. Corinthians 12 and Romans 12. And go through it. Ask the Spirit of God to go. Show me what is for me. Give me this and then say, Lord, guard my heart with your love. And help me to minister all this lovingly. That I am not a superman. I am not a superstar. That as soon as the crusade is over, the the, the security comes, puts you in your car and you go away. Jesus never went away like that. He stood there till the last man had been healed. 
And even though he was tired, he got into a boat. He hadn't eaten breakfast or lunch. You read scripture carefully. He crossed the sea, went to the other side. For one demon possessed man healed him, crossed over, continued healing the people. Because he was not a superman. He was a humble, lowly son of God. Who used his gifts in love. Guard your heart as you get gifted more and more. That you don't become proud and arrogant. Because it's a gift. It's a gift. You didn't earn it. It's a gift. But you should pursue, pursue love. Because we have too many superstars in Christendom today. Very few humble servants. Very few humble servants. Guard your heart. Guard your heart. But that's, that's what the cross is all about. It's all about love. We are not to use gifts to make a name for ourselves. All the gifts are for the edification of the brother. When my pride is at the center, then my gift is refused, I get upset. Pastor didn't call me to pray. I know why when I go outside, how many people have been healed when I pray? But Pastor never calls me. Why? Because the Spirit of the Lord has told Pastor, he or she is proud, don't call him into that holy sanctuary. And when you go out and do things on your own, God is saying, you're running on your own. careful. Because love is never offended. The humble man is never offended. The humblest of them all who came with all the gifts, all the power, all the knowledge, all the wisdom, sat quietly for 30 years. And went to a man whom he created and said, baptize me. And he said, no, you baptize me. He said, no, you baptize me. Why? All righteousness should be fulfilled. You do it. Doesn't matter, John. You do it. Keep it personal, okay? Don't talk about you, me, you, me, you, me. Just do it. Can you imagine if it was a format to us like today, John the Baptist saying, in the name of the Father? <laughs> what do I say? Say, son. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I baptize you, son. Jesus humbled himself like any common sinner who came to John. He humbled himself and said, baptize me too. You don't need to be baptized. doesn't matter. Baptize me. Baptize me. Are you getting it? Guard your heart. Guard your heart. Guard your heart. Because at the center of it is love. Love never gets offended. Love is broken over people, always broken over people. It will lead you more and more to the prayer closet, seeing where your brother, your sister is headed. Submission and love are two sides of the same coin. Two sides of the same coin. They are different, with the same coin. Two sides of the same coin. So, you want to get back to your first love as a church? We become a submissive church. We become a loving church. And then third, we come to Ephesians 5, 26 and 27. That you might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. That you might present her to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. I want to call it the third thing about that church. It is wrinkle free and stainless. But let's put it as glorious. Now, like I told you in the beginning, the only model we have in the entire universe of perfection is God Himself. So that's why He's Beautifying the bride and presenting her to himself. Human love, they say, love is blind. Meaning, in the initial stages of your love, love is blind. You don't see the flaws of your beloved. And when things start getting a little rough, only thing you see are the flaws of your beloved. But God's love, to love God, you don't have to be blind. Because he's pure is perfect. There's no flaw in him at all. There's no flaw I can find in my lover. 
He is the fairest of 10,000. There's no flaw in him. Absolutely no flaw in him. Psalm 27 and verse 4. 27 and verse 4. We take only part of the verse which David says and we prayerfully say it. But he tells a reason. One thing I have desired of the Lord that I will seek thee, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. We all say that much. For what? To behold the beauty of the Lord. When I look at you, wow. Perfect. Flawless. Who? There's nobody like you. He's flawless. He's perfect. He's beautiful. This is one marriage you cannot have complaints about how the spouse looks like. It's beauty. Now we are not talking about a physical beauty, okay? On the other hand, when he looks at me, he sees all my imperfections and he doesn't give up on me. Patiently, lovingly and firmly, he's working on all of us to make me wrinkle-free and stainless. Not stainless steel, but stainless. The Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit in the heavenly realms runs a beauty parlor. To prepare the bride for the great day. What they use as cosmetics for beautifying the bride is the blood of the Son, the water of the Word and the power of the Holy Spirit to make us beautiful. That's what it says. The blood, the Word, and the Holy Spirit is the one who sanctifies, takes off the wrinkles, takes off the saints, and makes us without blemish. And the more we allow Him to work on us, the interesting part is the more we will look like Him. Because God has only one picture to work on. I have to make you like Him. I have to work, make you look like Him. Are you getting the picture? What is to make without? Without? A wrinkle? Glorious spot or wrinkle or any such thing. He said, when it comes to making my son's bride beautiful, expense no matter. The sky is the limit. How much can I spend on it? Gabriel must have asked. He said, my son, spend him on it. Pour his blood out. There's nothing more expensive in the universe. It's very strange, I'll tell you. People listen to my messages. They think, oh, he's such a tough, conservative pastor. Do you think he will allow his spouse to go to the beauty parlor? Definitely. Go make yourself beautiful. Do you think he will spend money on your clothes? Here's my ATM card. Spend what you want on your clothes. Why? Husbands learn this lesson. The original husband says, when it comes to keeping my bride beautiful, the sky is the limit. I'm just telling you an application. Don't take it literally and run to the shopping mall. But I'm telling you an application. And when she turns around and tells, honey, can I buy you something? You say, honey, I don't need anything. I am perfect. Just like Jesus. The more you become beautiful, the more you look like me. Got the trick, men? I don't need anything. Why? We men are perfect when it comes to looks. Okay. But it's poor things. So who goes shopping all the time? Women, so they can look more like us. <laughs> Just tricks how to keep peace and stability in your house. Okay. Okay. But the key is when it comes to beautifying his bride, God says, 
the sky is the limit. I'm working on you. I'm working on you. I want to make you a glorious, a radiant, wrinkle-free, stainless wife. And God says, the more I work on you, what does it say? 21 days guaranteed. Fairer to fairer to fairer. God says, no. I guarantee you, you will let me work through your lifetime from glory to glory to glory to glory. One day will shine just like my son. Glory. Glory, he says. I'm working on you. You have no idea. Or I don't see. God says, don't worry. When you look in the mirror, I will only show you imperfections. But I'm working on you. One day the glory will be revealed. So scripture says you have no idea. The whole of creation is groaning for the sons of God to be revealed. He says, I have kept it hidden. Hidden from everybody. I'm working on you. Working on you. Working on you. He says, he points at my sin and says, clean up. I'll clean it up for you, but clean up. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 to 14. Eleven. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. What has appeared? Is that is that true in the Old Testament? No. The law of Moses appeared to all men and said, get your act ready. No. In the New Testament, God says, you know what? I'm going to try something else. I'm going to come to you in love. Grace is all about God's love. The grace of God, the love of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungod- ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously and godly in the present age. Looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearance of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, the, best, the Prince is coming. And the Prince says, in my love I am telling you, clean, do, clean up. Clean up. It's love that gives the power to say no. It's the love of God that gives power to say no. I love you. Joseph loved the God of his father Jacob. And when Potiphar's wife came, he looked her in the eye and said, Nope. Nope. There are no laws in Egypt. There is no laws applicable to him to keep in Potiphar's house. But he said, there's one law. You know what? That's the law of love. I love my God. And he said, no. Another man stumbled. Stumbled very badly. His name was David. He also worked on the law of love. He said, Lord, I stumbled. I want your love back. God said, take it. Take it. Both are called godly men. Both are called godly men. One who didn't fall at all in his record. One who fell so badly, but both operated on love. Lord, I have fallen. I have lost that capacity to love. I love you, but I can't love you. You have to do it. God said, take it. I'll restore back the joy. I'll clean you. I'll do the cleaning up. And God looked at the second man and said, that man, you know what? It's a man after my own heart. Wherever you are caught, good like Joseph, a fallen like David, come back to God and says, Lord, I want to love you. I want to be a glorious, radiant person and a glorious, radiant church. And God says, the message is not secret. It's public. Matthew 5 and verse 16. Let your Light so shine before men that they may see your good works. I want to take the word light off and put love there. Let your love shine. Because that's the light. Some people's love are like this photographer's flash bulb. (laughs) Gone. Next time to see, somebody has to come and click. It doesn't burn like this, steady. God says, that's not the way light is. Light is steady. Some people are so carnal and they have put it at low simmer. You can't see the light at all. 
It's covered by lust and fleshly appetites and anger and pride and everything. Light is there. They're born again. They call a carnal Christian. But the light is kept under. You can't see it. God says, raise it up. Raise it up. Raise it up. Let your light shine. You're supposed to be a glorious, radiant, bright. Let your love shine. Raise the wick. God's love is not secret. That is why His love was lifted up above the earth. It is not secret. He went public about His love. When He died on the cross, there was none who loved Him. He said, I still want to go public and say, I love you. And then we come to the last one in that section. 5 verses 28 to 29. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. I want to read that carefully. Aside, aside. We wish it was written this way. He who loves himself loves his wife. Because many people don't love themselves. They have come with so much baggage from the past and they hate themselves. God says, no. I won't give you that excuse. Even if you don't love yourself, love your wife. Love, he who loves his wife, loves himself. And then, for no one has ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. So what is the fourth one? A church that nourishes and cherishes. Are you a person who nourishes and cherishes? Are we? Which means, what does nourishing and cherishing mean? It means it nurtures growth. Means it takes unbelievers from outside, makes them believers, and then makes them into disciples and sends them out to serve the Lord. That's a church that nurtures. That's what God does with each one of us. A nurturing church. It promotes spiritual growth. For Christ nurtures us, God says, nurture one another. Why? We feed and take care of the body. This is where the preaching, the rebuking, the encouraging, the exhorting, all comes. Why? Because love cares, love nourishes, love cherishes. Are you getting the picture? A baby grows most at the initial ages. Within two to three months, it can double its weight. Some people do that later also. But usually babies, all babies do that. Scripture here talks about in First Peter chapter 2 and verse 2. As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. What is God saying? The newborn babies in the church nourish them and cherish them that they may grow. Old ones don't come first to the pastor and say, I got a problem. Stand back and take care of the small ones, the new ones who have come. Nourish them, feed them, let them grow. And you will see new believers just exploding if you give them the right environment. They just grow like that. Old ones struggle. God says, nurture. Nurture them. Cherish them. Value them. Value them. Nourish them. As newborn babes. Do you take in the word? Do you take in a daily supply of the word of God? Do you? But it also needs, remember, hands on. If you any mother or parent over here who had babies, you know, oh boy, baby can eat. Quite a number of times a day. It's not three or six. Sometimes it's sixteen or twenty times a day it will drink. And as it drinks, it also soils. Meaning, newborn believers will make a lot of mess. Take care of them. Cherish them. Know that they are a baby. Be more patient with them. I don't want this baby. Abigail, you go away. Do you say that? But when grown up 
believers act like babies, then we wonder what's wrong here. But God says, nourish the church and cherish it. Give it all your patience. Give it time. Mentor the ones you are teaching in your Bible studies. Nourish them in your corporate. You all have Bible studies taking care of. Take care of them. Maybe it's one. That's all it's needed. Maybe it is two. How many sheep do you think it takes to take get a kingdom? Simple mathematical question from the Bible. How many sheep do you need to nurture and cherish to get a kingdom? According to David too. One day a lion came and took a sheep. I went and got it back. Another day a bear came and took it. I got it back. God says you are getting Israel. Because you nourish and cherish your father's sheep. You will take care of my people. That is all it takes. Two sheep. If that is all the number of people who are coming in your Bible stem, nourish them, cherish them. You will receive a kingdom. Because you are found faithful with few. No one hates its own body. No one hates its own body. You cannot hate its own body. You love and cherish the body. It doesn't happen by accident, all these things. It takes time, it takes effort, there's a lot of endurance that is needed, but God says, work on it. Come back, come back, get together, come back. Hebrews 10, verses 24 and 25. Keep doing, keep doing, keep doing the things it's Pastor Stubbs, if I remember, long time back saying, a successful marriage is doing the right things over and over and over and over and boringly every day, over and over again, marriage is successful. Which is true. And we want romance and excitement every day. God says, no, it is, what do you think? I am so excited every day. I am doing the same things. Rebuking you, correcting you, wiping you up, putting you back, wiping you up, putting you back. How exciting do you think it is for God? But God says, I don't give up. I don't give up. Because I love you. No parent here I know has given up. Because the baby wet, wet the bed one more time. One more time I'm promising you Abigail I'm throwing you out. Oh Joshua, enough. Enough. You've been having the runs for the past three days. Enough. I'm telling you one last time. This is the last time. God also doesn't say. Nourish. And cherish. And let us consider one another in order to stir up what? Love and first stir up love. You shouldn't have good works without love. It's worth nothing in God's sight. Stir up love and good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ours left together. As is the manner of some. But exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. As the day keeps on approaching. Closer and closer and the closer what is happening, you are growing more and more and more. Because you are nurturing and cherishing one another. And not looking down. Not looking down. Because even the tiniest, weakest believer has something to offer to the body. If you don't believe that, get me a hammer and give me a small toe. I will show you how much you will value it suddenly. How many of you think about your small little toe all the time? You don't even think about it, right? Until somebody stamps on it. Then you realize, oh, I didn't realize you were so important. That's what God says. You thought that little brother who came there and sits at the back was not important. He was important. And if he's out of balance, your whole body is out of balance. Take care of him too. Take care of him too. Watch over to him. Nurture him too. Cherish him too. Because I cherish him. My little toe has never told me in my life, why do you put me in the sock and in the shoe all the time you go out? I also want to be seen. He never says that. There are some people in the church who will never be seen visibly. God says, doesn't matter, I still cherish them. They are important in my plan for the overall body of Christ. They are important. That's why we cherish and we nourish. Everybody who is there, we have to. Go, meet them and tell them, we care. We care. Are you getting the picture, church? Now shall we go back to Revelation 2, 4 and 5?
Nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. Go back. Being a submissive church, a loving church, a radiant church, and a nurturing, cherishing church. Go back, he says. Because your love for me is also seen in your love for one another. Nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. Remember therefore from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first. That is the key. Go back and do the first works. How we used to be so zealous for me and for my people. Just go back and start doing that. The love, the passion, the zeal, everything will come back. Because don't forget how I love you. And how I have stood by you all these years. I have loved you with an everlasting love. As we close, I want that slide up on the, a strange slide. I'll tell you. You can see it very clearly. You see this Afro-American brother and this white brother. His name is Jackie Robinson. And the other gentleman's name is P.V. Reese. Why it is so important is he was the first, let's use a term which we all understand, he was the first black man to play major league in U.S. Till then, it was exclusively for the white sportsmen. Blacks never broke into that league. He was the first one to break in. And he had to face a lot of opposition whichever ground he played. One day he was playing in his own yard, Brooklyn, in the stadium there in Brooklyn. I don't know the name of the Brooklyn. And this thing, and he made a wrong pass. And the white, predominantly white crowd booed and hooted and booed and hooted at him. And he stood there nervously until Reese just walked to him and put his arm around him and looked at the crowd. The crowd went silent. I was and you were one like him. Oppressed. Every time we came out, the enemy booed and booed and booed at us at every fall until one day a nail pierced and blood stained hand put around my shoulder and looked at the demons in the heaven and said, Try it once more. He is mine. I stand beside him all the days of his life. Remember that. That is the first love. That is his love for you and me. When we were an object of scorn, the demons were like, this is the one you created in your image. Look at him. Look at her. Look at him. Look at him. One day God came and put his arm around him and said, now boo. You can. Never forget that. That's the key. Never, ever forget where we came from. Don't forget from where he picked us up. That's the equalizer. We all were sinners worthy of death. Salvation was a gift. Salvation means the prince looked out of the window and fell in love with the peasant girl. She didn't even know he had fallen in love with her. When he came and walked into a village, she didn't even know who he was. That's why scripture says, when we were yet sinners, Christ Jesus came and died for us. Don't forget that. Doesn't matter what we become. Five years, fifteen years, five thousand churches, fifty thousand churches, name, reputation, forget it. All that means nothing. The reason we are here is because He first loved us. He first loved us. And God says, this anybody fallen short of that. Go back to your first works. Go back to that first love and say, Lord, you are the fairest of 10,000. You are the rose of Sharon. I want to be in your house because I want to dwell on your beauty. And the more I dwell on your beauty, I look down into my brothers and my sisters. I see your beauty. And where it doesn't, I want to help. And when they don't receive my help, I want to come 
broken before you. Why? Remember? Again yesterday's message. Every road will take a fork. You can go either this way or that way. This way is the way of Cain. The way of the devil. He is called the accuser of the brethren who accuses them before God day and night. Revelation 12 will say, day and night he accuses the brethren. There is another road, road which is the road of Jesus which says, he makes intercession for the saints before the Father day and night. Which will you join? Everybody will have to come to this fork one day. And decide. You can't stay there. You will either go this way or that way. Cain went this way. Abel went this way. Aaron went this way. Moses went this way. Miriam went this way. Moses went this way. Korah went this way. Moses went this way. Stuck to this road. You can do whatever you want. I will intercede for you. That's all I will do. Lot went this way. Must have made fun of the old man. He said, Father, rescue him. Which way will you go? Which road will you take? That's what it's all about. Authentic church. An interceding church. A praying church. A loving church. A cherishing church. A radiant church. A nurturing church. And as we go into our fifth year, let's keep this in our heart and say, Lord, I want to pursue love. I want to pursue love. And everything that I do, help me to be motivated by your love. It should be because of your love. Because you first loved me. And I want to love back you and everybody with the same love. Even those who hate me, Lord, I'll pray for them. I'll bless them. That's all I will do. But pray for those who hate you more than those who love you. Because you know what? The one who hates you abides in death. Doesn't matter what their title is. The ones who hate you abides in death. Pray pray for them more than you pray for those who love you. We usually invert the order. No, no, no. Pray for those who hate you more than those who love you. Amen. Father, this morning, we come to you, Lord, as a church. As humble as we can. In our old self, there is no humility. But we have been made new in you. And you are humble and lowly. Meek. We want to come just like you before the Father. And today, Lord, above all, we want to pray for our enemies. Those who choose to harm us, to kill us, to wound us, to talk ill about us, to destroy us. Oh, Father, I pray you will reach out and touch them today. With those same nail pierced hands. They do this. But they haven't experienced your love. Oh Father touch them. Deal with that hatred. In their hearts. For they do not know they abide in death. And you do not. Rejoice to see any sinner perish. Your heart breaks for each one of them. I pray Father. You will touch them today. Turn their lives around, O God, that they too may experience the love of God. To know that you cherish them, you love them, you care for them. And it's for them too, you died on the cross. Touch them. Touch their hearts. Touch their minds. Set them free from those prison walls in which they have locked themselves in. I speak life into their situations. I speak life. Touch them, O God. Touch them. Let the life of Christ go forth and touch them. That they may learn to experience your love and learn to love. And 
we as a church we come to you with thanksgiving been good to us so good to us we take no credit for what has happened in the past one year because we know it is not of us but there was nothing in us that could have done anything that has happened the so father today as your church as your body we give you all the glory all the honor for all that has happened in the past one year thank you father for all the brethren you have joined to us in the spirit around the world those who have carried day and night with us prayed for us fasted for us cried out to you hours and hours days so many spent for us brothers whom they did not know sisters whom they did not know yet they knew us by name because you put that burden in their hearts for us i prayed lord all of our churches will be loving submissive radiant nourishing nurturing churches for you have said if you do so then we lift christ jesus and you will draw all men towards you help us as individuals too to be submissive loving radiant and nurturing sons and daughters of the living god may your presence go ahead of us through this coming year we surrender the year ahead into thy hands and we pray lord that your will be done whatever has to be done i pray father there'll be surrender in each one's life that you will do it through us i speak your power and your provision above all lord your loving presence into everyone's life that each one will walk in that loving presence all that we did wrong in thy sight in the past one year where we have come short where we have sinned as a body as individuals sinned against you sinned against one another as your servant father i seek your forgiveness that you will forgive us as a church and restore anyone has lost the joy restore the joy of thy salvation renew our strength that we may walk in the power of your love and serve in love and in power thank you for everyone here and also for those who were once part of this body those who have left thank you for each one and i bless each one in your name may the blessing of the living god pursue them all the days of their life and overtake them let them eat the good of the land let there be always bread in their basket provision in their homes and love and tenderness in their hearts thank you father thank you praise you god i worship you god give you glory and honor for in jesus precious name we pray in the grace of our lord jesus christ the love of the father and the fellowship of the holy spirit rest and abide with each one of us